hear some coming. It's the exciting part of any event, watching the number climb as you kick off the webinar. <laughs> Hello, everyone. I'm Joyce Barrett with Heritage Ohio, and I want to welcome you to the last session of Heritage Ohio's 10 day mm -hmm. virtual conference. Uh, we're so glad that you've joined us for this finale that we hope is a segue into next year's in person conference, and we will keep our fingers crossed as we watch uh, data on that. I want to begin by thanking Sandvik Architects for their conference title sponsorship, Kuhn Restoration for their uh, conference sponsorship, and the Turner Foundation, which sponsored today's session this afternoon. So today we have uh, Kevin Rose, who is a historian with the J.M. Turner Foundation and also a member of the Heritage Ohio Board. And Kevin is going to give us a presentation zooming through Springfield history to get people excited about next year. Thank you, Kevin, and take it away. Yeah, thank you, Joyce. Uh, thank you for inviting me, not uh, how we were envisioning uh, this year's conference uh, as we as we were working on it hoping it to be in Springfield this year but we're excited uh, we will be excited uh, fingers crossed that we'll be able to welcome everyone to Springfield next year uh, so the the point of this is zooming through Springfield history uh, I will share my screen here and uh, so give me one second so the idea is to take a really, really quick look at Springfield history. Um, I had, you know, as much time as, well, not as much time, I guess, as we're, we're allotted, but uh, do a, a quick overview of 200 years of what I consider to be a very interesting city. I'm not from Springfield. Uh, I really fell in love first with the city's history and, and now with its renewal and um, revitalization of, of, of the town and uh, call it home now. It's, it's, a, it's a great place to live. And again, I look forward to welcoming you, a lot of you, uh, to Springfield next year. So I'm, I'm only going to feature kind of things that make Springfield different or special. Uh, I, you know, you, you all know about the Great Depression and World War I and World War II and these, these huge major events in American history. And for the most part, we as a nation experience them in very similar ways. I'm going to try to focus more on what separates Springfield historically, uh, given that I'm trying to cover 200 years in, in, in such a relatively short period of time. So let's, let's get going. So I broke it down into sections. And again, I'll move quickly. Uh, I, I understand that the full history of every bit of Springfield history is, might not be as interesting to you as it is to me. Uh, so I'll move quite quickly through a lot of this and, and really focus, uh, this builds up to um, what is the city today and how have we used this, this history, this heritage um, as, as part of our um, revitalization strategy. So the beginning is a sleepy frontier town. Um, Springfield was founded in 1801, two years before the state of Ohio was created, um, or at least uh, it became a state. Um, and it really has no natural advantages. Uh, it sits on a stream, but a stream that's deep enough that you could stand in. So it, it's not really navigable for, for waterway uses. Um, here you'll see it located on this uh, 1804 map of Ohio. So small, it's not even labeled on the map. There is another Springfield labeled. I'm not sure whatever happened to that one. Uh, we became the Springfield in Ohio, and, and that one obviously changed names or maybe as a township. And again, it doesn't really have natural advantages. This is, it becomes, it's mostly the center of the county when it becomes, um, when the Clark County becomes a county in 1818. So it becomes the county seat, but in large part, just because of its location more than anything and that it was established. And you can see just how small that stream is um, uh, that feeds into the Mad River. Uh, I was originally called Lagonda River. Uh, now we call it Buck Creek, unfortunately. They called it both, you'll even see on this map, it's, it'll say Buck Creek. Uh, Lagonda River is much more beautiful than Buck Creek. But anyway, I don't think I'm gonna change that today. But it's like most frontier towns, uh, building with what they have there. Uh, again, no natural advantages, no roads leading in or out of the town. 
no early canal ways, uh, although Ohio didn't have canals quite that early. Um, it's really that success is built by the ingenuity of the people in the town, not its natural advantages of where it's situated. Up to a certain point. Um, some of it is happenstance and luck. Uh, when the federal government uh, was deciding to build a national road across the United States uh, in the 18 teens and the 1820s, uh, leaving from Cumberland, Maryland, and crossing across the United States, the first federal highway, uh, it just so happened that the road was going to go through uh, Springfield. It wasn't really because of Springfield. Springfield just happened to be along the route. Uh, even more fortuitous, um, Andrew Jackson came into power, uh, and before the road ever made it to Springfield, was able to cut off funding for the road nationally. Uh, so when the road arrived to Springfield in 1835, 1836, um, the funding had ceased by that point and they were running out of money and the road physically ended in Springfield, Ohio. Uh, Springfield became known as the town at the end of the pike. So as travelers would travel westward in the United States, um, they would naturally stop in Springfield because the roads were not as not as nice after Springfield. Uh, there were still dirt trails like any communities, there's roads between the towns, but not nearly as nice, not nearly as smooth sailing as they had from Cumberland or wherever they joined onto the road all the way up to Springfield. And we see Springfield's population uh, really uh, explode in this period. Our population starts doubling every 10 years. Obviously, this is not a photograph from this period because the clarity, well, photographs don't exist in that period, but the clarity is, is uh, at beautiful. This is probably Kansas in 1890, but it's still a great illustrative image of showing travelers moving westward. Um, here you'll see the road. Uh, you can kind of see it if you see Clark County or Franklin County, that road moving across. It's, it's hard to get a sense and it shows it just continuing across the state because the, I, the identity, there's really no maps that show the road stopping in Springfield because the plan was always to continue the road and the states picked up the project. But it took them about 10 years till they were really able to get movement on the road and, and finish it uh, to Richmond, at least part of it to Richmond. It did ultimately continue, continue through uh, uh, to the far side of Illinois. And um, so for that period, Springfield is really perfectly situated. Uh, some things you'll see in Springfield from that period are the Pennsylvania House. Uh, this is the inn at the end of the pike. Uh, Springfield is the town at the end of the pike. Uh, uh, this is the uh, Traveler's Inn that was literally right at the end of the road where the road ended uh, in the United States and um, became popular because of that. Uh, it became this um, house, this building that had a much larger importance in Springfield history because of, I think, the mythology, the, the entire romance of this idea of there's this inn at the end of the pike. The reality is, is it's a pretty straightforward uh, federal style design um, from, from, these, from the 1830s. It was built in 1836, right as the road uh, ended, uh, the construction ended. And this house, thankfully, is still there. Uh, and I'll talk about it later on uh, as I'm talking about the renewal of Springfield. Okay, no, okay, good. Um, and then this is Springfield uh, in that period. Uh, this is a, a great painting. Springfield starts to blossom in terms of art and architecture in this period. Uh, wealthy families from the East Coast are moving into Springfield, families like the Warders, who were a very prominent Philadelphia family, and other families from really from uh, Massachusetts or Connecticut. Uh, down to Virginia, uh, really kind of prominent people that are moving west and, and finding uh, opportunities. And so <clears throat> Springfield really blossoms in this period with a, a number of artists and, and artisans moving into the community and really enhancing the cultural life of, of the village. So again, these are quite arbitrary uh, dates in many ways. This is me on a piece of paper sketching out, trying to think of eras. Uh, it changes each time I kind of think of eras, but for the purpose of this talk, um, the next big kind of moment is 1846, um, and that's when the railroad arrives in Springfield. So the railroad, there were two railroads, uh, early railroads in Ohio, one uh, out of Sandusky, um, the Sandusky and Springfield line, and then the Little Miami coming out to Cincinnati. The Sandusky line was actually the oldest. It began earlier, uh, the Cincinnati line a couple years later in the 18, late 1830s. Uh, but the the Cincinnati line, which is a shorter run, reached its destination first, and that was in 1846 here in Springfield, Ohio. Uh, it's something we don't talk about in Springfield at all. You won't see it in our history museum or any books somehow, uh, but Springfield was the uh, connection of the first two railroads in Ohio. Uh, so the Sandusky Railroad and the, um, 
the Cincinnati, the Little Miami Railroad met in Springfield, Ohio. Um, love this photograph of, a, of an early train on the Little Miami line. And to look at that next image, it's hard on the image on your left, but if you look at it, there's only, again, two railroads in the entire state. This is an uh, image from 1845. It's thinking forward to what the road will be because uh, they have not quite met. They don't meet until 1848 uh, in Springfield. And this is a, a very important moment in Ohio history because it's the first time that you can take um, outside of the canals, the first time you can take uh, merchandise that's coming in uh, from New York uh, through the canals and onto the lake. And when it gets to Ohio, put it on a much faster transportation. Uh, so you're able to move goods quite quickly back down to the down to the south end of Ohio to the Ohio River and from the Ohio River on to New Orleans. A really, really important moment, not just in Ohio, but really in American history. Um, and uh, tourism also will start picking up because uh, newspapers around Ohio will start advertising that if you can get to the railroad, you can actually make it to New York City. And I forget the number of hours. It's, it's like 48 hours. Uh, total total time by the time you get on the railroad, make it to Lake Erie, get on a boat, then get on the canal uh, and, and make it to uh, New York City. So another really important moment, obviously for Ohio altogether, but is the Underground Railroad. Uh, this is something we'll see um, later. Um, the, the Gammon House, it's something we'll, we'll see, sorry, when, when we're in Springfield. Um, Springfield became, because of its position, became a really important city on the Underground Railroad. Uh, Xenia is another one of those, obviously Cincinnati. I don't know that there is a more important city than Cincinnati. Sandusky, Cleveland, Ohio has a strong heritage in this. But um, Springfield is thankful to have one of the few remaining uh, Underground Railroad safe houses that were operated by African Americans. African Americans were a majority of the people operating the Underground Railroad. Early studies were incorrect on this. Uh, it was not uh, the the enterprise of, of white families, although they were involved. It was mostly African American families who were operating the Underground Railroad, and it makes sense um, when when you think about it. Uh, African Americans helping fellow African Americans, sometimes former slaves helping escaping slaves, and this is the house for the Gammons that was built in 1850. They were helping from all records that we have well before this house was built, but then for 15 years after this house was built were harboring uh, fugitive slaves uh, in, in this property. And I say fugitive slaves because it was built the same year as the, the Fugitive Slave Act. So this is actually walking distance from the hotel that we'll be using at next year's conference. Uh, but this is a really important um, part of Springfield's history. And our <clears throat> history of our African-American community is really, really strong, uh, quite a, a remarkable history. And I just have to show this. You're always looking for that great marketing shot. Uh, this is looking out of the basement at, um, at the Gammon House. Uh, I took this photo myself. It sent chills down when you get into that dark basement and you look back and the only light coming in is through that access door from the outside. Obviously some concrete steps that were added later, uh, but this is the original entry door into the, into the family's basement. So then this is what we know ourselves as still today is the champion city here in Springfield. And again, uh, somewhat arbitrary dates, 1866, uh, the end of the Civil War uh, and up to 1902. And 66 is an important date because in that year, we have, we have a major company that produces harvesting machines called Whiteley, Fasser and Kelly. And then they come up with a partnership with two other companies rather than making products to compete against each other, they're going to partner together and they're going to produce one product jointly out of their own, sorry, on their own, out of their own factories, but single products using the same patents and then agree to not compete each other by dividing the world into three parts. Uh, and then as a uh, effort of vertical integration, I hope my economics professor is not on the call because I believe it's vertical integration. Uh, they start taking up the supply chains from railroads to uh, the suppliers of the iron and things like this. So they really, between these independent separate companies, have a partnership where they uh, have the ability to really uh, gain a foothold in the market. And because of that partnership and because of the Great Chicago Fire in 1871, uh, destroying one of their main competitors, uh, Springfield becomes the leading city in the world producing farm machinery uh, about 1870, 71, 72. We're not quite sure exactly what period that is. Um, we, you see it claimed in the 1870s newspapers, but there's not a moment that they, they take that. So we don't have an absolute date on when that happens. But this is important. This makes Springfield a Silicon Valley or a Detroit. 
uh, of its period, um, producing the number one city in the world, producing uh, the number one product, which is tools for farmers. Um, and a lot of what I will show you next is all a result of that. It's both the result and just part of the overall uh, ethos, part of the overall environment that Springfield has. They viewed themselves as the champion city, as the next great American city. Uh, the population continues to explode. The city becomes one of the 100 largest towns in America in, in the 1870 census. Uh, 1880 census stays that way. Uh, but then through the slow decline of that industry, um, other cities are growing more rapidly uh, after that date, although Springfield did continue to, to grow in population. Some of the things that you'll see uh, that are absolutely beautiful and, and thankfully still here uh, uh, when you're in Springfield next year, one is our city building and market, now our Heritage Center Museum, which I'll mention later, a building that was built for our city government um, as the main uh, halls of uh, government and also the main city marketplace. It was finished, it started in 1887, finished in 1890. And sometimes I think the importance of this building is lost on, on us as, as a community. We, of course, see it as beautiful, but it's not, cities don't build buildings like this. You know, Minneapolis might, right? New York City might. Uh, big metropolises build cities like this, but for the most part, grand ornamental architecture like this is the purview of county governments with their county courthouses, not cities. Uh, very, very rare for a city to build something of this magnitude. The building is about 467 feet long uh, and about 50 feet wide. Uh, as I tell on our children's tours, it has the proportions of a hot dog um, and it's still quite elegant and beautiful, uh, which is just a testament to the architect. Uh, a young architect in his 20s, a locally, uh, locally grown, if you will, uh, architect named Charles Krieger. And I love using this image because if you didn't know, you might think this is Paris, right? Or you might think it's London, um, in part because this photo is taken right after a snowfall. Uh, so you don't see the bricks, it kind of looks like sand, which is part of what makes it feel like Paris. Uh, little footsteps and I say sand, you know, that gravel mix for those of you that have have uh, wasted away uh, whole days in, in Parisian parks. They're really enchanting and you, you get that feeling with this image. Uh, this is Springfield of the 1890s. It viewed itself in, in epic proportions. It, it thought of itself as the great American city. Um, I didn't use it in this slide, but the, they were issuing a magazine called The Champion Illustrated and on the front of it is this goddess with a cornucopia and out of the cornucopia are spilling all of the products that Springfield produced in the, the 1880s and 1890s. And the slogan was at the bottom, we feed the earth. Because we, we saw ourselves in that way that we were the ones producing the food for the earth by producing the products that allow farmers uh, to bring uh, those, those uh, products to market. So again, often as you can imagine, I have this as the background on my computer because it's a beautiful image to look at uh, day in and day out. And we continue to build architecture at this scale and at, with this mindset. Um, this is the Bushnell building uh, from 1890, a, I'm sorry, 1894, uh, started in 1892, finished in 1894 by the famous Boston firm, Shepley, Rattan and Coolidge. These are the successors to Henry Hobson Richardson. Um, they designed something earlier, which I'll talk about in a second in part for the transition later. Um, and into another topic, but uh, really just a, a beautiful work of architecture that uh, we'll do some tours while you're in Springfield. I, I give entire lectures just on this building and how important it is in the course of American architecture. Uh, I can't get into all of that, right? We're zooming, we're zooming through Springfield history. Um, this is the Bushnell Mansion. Uh, all of these buildings, by the way, are still standing. Um, we have, like any uh, post-industrial city, lost our fair share of Victorian architecture, but thankfully, uh, most of our most important buildings are still standing. Uh, this is a monumental work of architecture by one of New York City's most famous architects, Robert Robertson. Um, I love anyone that has a, a repeat name like that, uh, which is one of the things that attracted me to him initially, uh, right? Uh, Patrick Fitzpatrick, Robert Robertson, and uh, really a gifted architect that was following the style of Henry Hobson Richardson. And this is uh, probably Ohio's first work um, of finished work of the Richardsonian Romanesque style. 
Uh, later on, it was, it was often used in publications as the definitive piece of Richardsonian Romanesque architecture. It would be, they would be like the classic example of Richardsonian Romanesque and use this, which is really unfortunate because it's not by Richardson himself, but it shows how much um, Robertson was copying his style that uh, he often gets associated with um, as, as that perfect example. And then, as I mentioned a second ago, our other design by Shepley, Rattan, and Coolidge. This is Warder Library. This is a couple years earlier, but I put it here because I think this is an, a, a great transition point into the next era of Springfield history, and that is the progressive era, which I don't call it that. Um, this is uh, buildings from 1890 and really, really important um, in American architecture, uh, being one of eight libraries by the firm, uh, a firm that uh, helped redefine the idea of what American library is. Um, really a, a monumental work of architecture. I would say our most, our second most significant uh, piece of architecture in, in our community. Many of you know which one, what the other one is. Uh, it's included later, so I'll, I'll, I'll leave that. But um, it is uh, an absolutely beautiful building that we're thankful to have. And it's by the Warder family, this prominent family from, from uh, Philadelphia. And it's it's a tribute to the workers of the community. Um, this was built for the workers right between two of the biggest working class neighborhoods in Springfield, an African-American neighborhood, and yes, African-Americans were allowed uh, in the library um, in, in the Victorian period uh, here in Springfield, and then the Irish neighborhood called Irish Hill. Um, uh, really, really important in, in what it says about the way the community um, understood the importance of workers. It also so happens that this is on the back of some of the largest labor uprisings in American history, uh, including the Haymarket riot in 1886, which uh, a little known fact actually started outside the McCormick factories, uh, one of Springfield's main competitors and a good friend of Mr. Warder. So I think he was worried about that and was building this as a tribute, as, as a monument to, to the people of Springfield. So our progressive era is in many ways the Rose City. Um, Springfield is a leading city in, in the nation in progressive era reform uh, in a variety of ways. Uh, the City Beautiful mu movement, um, it, there is no origin to the City Beautiful movement. There are multiple uh, disparate origins, but Springfield is one of them. Um, in well before 1902, but by the turn of the century, 1902 is when uh, international harvesters created. So our ag implement companies merge and they merge with other conglomerates and the headquarters move out of town. And that's kind of a symbolic end and it's not an end, but it's, it's the turning point on Springfield's prominence as being the, the ag implement uh, capital or farm machinery capital of the world and a transition then into being the greenhouse capital of the world. Uh, there's records that claim that the Innisfallen greenhouses were the largest greenhouses in, in North America, uh, others that say the world. Um, records that say Springfield had more uh, acreage under glass than any other city in the world. What we know is true is that we grew more potted roses and potted plants than any other city in the world. So there are these massive, massive uh, greenhouses that did take up literally football field size, uh, even larger in the uh, late Victorian period, growing these plants. We had many companies, George Mellon and Company, Good and Reese and Company. And then out of these companies came a larger movement in civic reform. A lot of these people, uh, as you can imagine, these florists uh, are, are very interested in the role of, of horticulture and community revitalization, the beautification efforts, uh, cleaning up trash, painting fences, uh, putting in paved walkways, uh, connecting humans back to nature. Uh, Jesse Good, uh, who published this piece of a lot of pieces, uh, the work of civic improvement, is with Good and Reese. She also had her own seed company. And she is one of the founders, if you will, um, if you can use that term for such a broad movement, but one of the founders of the City Beautiful Movement in America. And Springfield became this leading city. And at the same time, we started to become a publishing house where Springfield was publishing more and more magazines, including the Home Florist, Flowers and Gardens, um, uh, Woman's Home Journal, or no, Woman's Home Companion. Uh, a variety of publications that Springfield becomes this publishing house. So there's a lot of um, intellectual debate about the future of our country and, and uh, everything that is you know, these debates that are happening in the, in the progressive era. And Springfield naturally become that, becomes one of those centers. Actually, the Chautauquan is also published uh, here in Springfield. Um, so you see a lot of that then manifested in the built environment in Springfield, a strong movement towards, towards the beautification uh, of the community. 
and not just beautification. There's also large movements on, in sanitary reform, park reform, uh, one of the first cities to bring in um, uh, George Kessler, uh, kind of the, the godfather of uh, the progressive era park reform movement uh, to really kind of reshape the city with, with that. And then one of the first cities in America to adopt the city manager form of government uh, to try to get rid of the corruption of the, the boss style that, that predated it. So this is what I was hinting at before, our, our most significant work of architecture. Uh, dare I say maybe Ohio's most significant work of architecture, um, certainly up there in the top five with, with some amazing buildings that we're, we're blessed with in the state of Ohio, including our two Louis Sullivan banks. Um, this is something we will definitely be at at the conference. This is a spot that I kind of, it's a second home for me. Uh, I've worked with the museum on an offer, mostly on uh, since 2001, so gonna be 20 years next year. Um, I met my wife through that organization. She is now their director. Uh, she was their founding curator. Uh, so I le uh, live and breathe Westcott House. Literally, I will get home tonight and then we will talk about Westcott and our children for the rest of the night. That's what we do. Um, and so we're really blessed to have this um, house and this organization uh, in our community. And then also, again, as part of City Beautiful and everything that's happening, we're one of the first cities um, to, in Ohio, but one of the early um, cities to work in some of these City Beautiful um, uh, suburban neighborhoods. So this is Ridgewood neighborhood, which we'll hopefully get a chance to see while we're in town, uh, de designed by a Cleveland architecture firm. And um, it's built for, for Harry Kissel, who is uh, a founder of the Federal Home Loan Bank, and uh, right in this period, the national president of the uh, American or the United States Board of Realtors, the National Board of Realtors. Uh, so a really important individual in American history, a colleague of mine who uh, is no longer living, unfortunately, um, but had a theory and was hoping to work on a book where she believes that Harry Kissel's Babbitt, for those of you that have read the book Babbitt, um, not necessarily a, a kind portrayal, uh, but, um, but yeah, which shows his, his significance. And then one of his other projects is uh, Springfield's first skyscraper. Uh, for those of you that are joining in from, from Ohio's three larger cities, uh, the, the three C's, you're looking at this going skyscraper, uh, but it is obviously, it's a, it's a steel frame uh, uh, curtain wall construction. Um, it was built as Springfield's first skyscraper, a nine story building. And in this period, Springfield builds multiple buildings that are nine story. At one point we had, I believe, four, four buildings that were, that were nine, three buildings that were nine stories and another one that was, that was nearly as tall. So really some, some monumental architecture. The scale of the, the urban core was that of a big city or that of a small city. And then something that I'm deeply passionate about in this period is the Great Migration. Another topic I don't think we talk enough about here in Springfield. Uh, because of Springfield being an industrial powerhouse, during the Great Migration from roughly, I mean, there's all different types of periods, but 1900, 1910 to about 1940, uh, 1942, leading up to the start of World War II, uh, a massive uh, influx of African Americans uh, from the South uh, looking for better opportunities, looking to escape Jim Crow policies of the South, um, and a huge boost to our population in the 19 teens and 1920s. It's not all good, um, but uh, there's a lot of animosity and strife that moves up because at the same time we have lar a large influx of um, white populations from both the east, and when I say the east I mean rural Pennsylvania, the middle of Pennsylvania, the Harrisburg area, a lot of Pennsylvania families that are moving west looking for opportunities, uh, and also southern families, Kentucky uh, and, and um, West Virginia, some Tennessee, and, and even further south, uh, white families moving up at the same time looking for opportunities and a lot of struggle and issues uh, that come about because of those uh, competing um, groups that are that are really fighting for the same jobs in these factories. Um, a, a, a tumultuous uh, but a really rich and interesting period of Springfield's history. Part of that, of course, if you have uh, a large number of um, African Americans moving north, you're going to have a large number of former slaves also moving north. So when you look at the, um, the um, slave narratives that were completed by the writers, um, Federal Writers Project, there we are. Uh, 
from what I can tell, the largest number, by far the largest number of uh, slaves interviewed were in Springfield, which shows just how large that African-American population is of people moving up from the South, including these two. And I just love this photo because they're such a, such a cute old, older couple. Uh, this is Tap and Susie Hawkins, uh, a married couple from the South. Um, they got married in the South and moved up uh, together. Um, but they moved up in the 1920s, uh, again, during uh, the Great Migration. And then Ben Hartman is one of those people that moves in uh, looking for opportunities. A factory molder in, in rural Pennsylvania, uh, outside of Harrisburg, uh, comes into Springfield, uh, gets a job, gets another job, moves around from, from factory to factory, working in various uh, enterprises. At one point, has a gardening company. And then in 1932, uh, uh, from the effects of the Great Depression, he loses his job or he's laid off from his job and he sets about constructing a world, a, a world of miniature in his backyard, um, which quickly overtakes his yard uh, and today is known as the Hartman Rock Garden, uh, one of our main uh, cultural tourism sites. And this is what I was uh, getting to earlier. Maybe if I would have planned my slides a little better, I would have put this right after the, the Great Migration slide. But the issues that we see in Springfield, um, I, I will go so far as to say that in the Victorian period, I don't know that you have a city in Ohio or really a city in the Midwest that is more open and more um, accepting of, of the African American community living in harmony side by side. By no, I, I don't want to try to fool anyone that this is a, a perfect place in that period. Um, it, in some ways, it's the best of the worst right? in, in terms of race relations. Uh, it's not uh, the way it might be today or the way we wish it to be today. Um, but it's still better than it is in a lot of other places. But then that changes rapidly uh, with the Great Migration and the influx of, of uh, Southern whites and Southern blacks uh, moving in, uh, really, again, looking for better opportunities. And for the most part, those opportunities were here. Springfield's growing rapidly. There's a lot of jobs available but that hatred follows um, and continues to get worse. And part of that, of course, uh, for those of you that are uh, students of American history, is uh, World War I and, and soldiers returning home and realizing they had better opportunities in France, um, even as, as foreigners, uh, than they did back on their own soil. Uh, so, so a really, again, tumultuous and rough period in Springfield history, but a key part of our identity. And, and as a historian, I don't shy away from, from talking about those topics. And we'll talk about them when you're here next year, because next year will be the 100th anniversary of our last race riot. Uh, Springfield had three race riots. Um, thankfully, nothing compared to the atrocities of a city like Tulsa or, or some other cities in the United States, but still very significant um, events. One of the main uh, employers in this period is the Kroll Publishing Company, which becomes Kroll Collier, uh, one of the nation's largest publishing houses. Um, this is this is by far uh, it's our second biggest employer, but in the urban environment, in the downtown core, by far our largest employer, employing thousands of people. In it, uh, by the end of the company's lifespan, they occupied an entire city block, uh, and about the scale that you see here. Um, what is that? Seven stories uh, on on the main structure, eight stories, uh, just a, a mammoth complex that unfortunately we have lost. Um, we lost the parts, they were demolishing it, and, and we lost the last bit of it earlier this year. Uh, really heartbreaking for me. If you Google Crow Call, you're, you'll probably see the, the very uh, fierce comments that I uh, relayed to the newspaper, in part additionally fierce because I was on vacation when this stuff was happening and I really didn't want to be bothered with the amazing stress of, of this uh, demolition. Uh, when I'm when I'm finally trying to get away with my family, and it, it really weighed on me that entire vacation, and um, because this was a, a horrific loss for our community to lose this this massive complex, and this is the, what we actually lost this year was this building that you're seeing uh, now, the most important building. By the way, I should add, it's it's Collier's Magazine, it's um, it's uh, Liberty Magazine. Uh, some of the most important publications in American history were published uh, out of out of that facility, and then renewal and decline. Uh, this is a period I don't talk too much about. It's not my main focus of my career, uh, but it's, it's interesting. Uh, it's similar to obviously what's happening in a lot of uh, post-industrial cities with the changes that are happening. This is Springfield uh, right about at the end of um, World War II. I think it's actually 47 this photo is taken. And you can see the city has not changed too much, 
but there's gonna be a rapid transformation of the city in the years following. Um, a number of factories continue to close or transition, uh, merge, uh, that, that period of mergers continues. Uh, they, right through kind of the middle of this image, they put a, we'll call it a highway. Uh, it's an overpass over that, those massive railroad tracks. Um, they demolish that beautiful train station that's in there uh, in the photo uh, right off the railroad tracks. And, and the city deteriorates quite rapidly, in part just because of changes that are happening in American history uh, or in America at the time, and in part because of bad planning, because of, uh, like most cities, I mean, Springfield's not unusual uh, in, in those regards in the 1940s and 50s. Some great things came out of that period in our community, but a lot of decline and despair. Uh, thankfully, I'm not ending the talk there. Uh, so this is one of my favorites. Uh, for those of you that can't stand modern architecture, you can just close your eyes or, or look away from your screen for a second. Uh, I love this building. It's a, a two-story building, which in some ways in the heart of the community right at the main intersection is a tremendous waste of space. Uh, our nine-story building is right across the street, so uh, quite a different sense of scale uh, between the two. But this is by Alfred Shaw, one of the great modernists in Chicago. Uh, at the same time he was designing this, he was designing the world's tallest marble structure, um, which is still standing there uh, right across from Marina City uh, on the river in Chicago. <clears throat> and then we get into the core renewal, uh, the urban renewal period of the 60s and 70s. This is specifically the late 70s. Um, actually, this photo was probably taken in 1980. Just if you look around, of course, the focus is right in the middle of the image, right, with the skyscraper being built uh, by uh, Skidmore, Owens, and Merle, uh, arguably the most famous architecture firm in, in America at that time. Um, but we, of course, were not getting their, their A-list architects. We were getting kind of their B or maybe C-list architects, although we were originally going to work with IM Pay directly on this project uh, and eventually they, they decided to switch. Uh, Springfield had a friend who was a good friend or a community member who's a good friend of IM Pays and it was quite close for him designing all of this. But if you look in the periphery, you'll see a lot of the parking lots, the decline and a lot of the other modern structure. Uh, a lot of concrete, a lot of steel and a lot of reflective glass. Um, the first two are not necessarily uh, detrimental to a, a, the urban feel, but the third one is. Uh, the reflective uh, glass created a dead environment throughout the community. You could walk for blocks and see nothing but, but concrete in your own reflection. Um, and naturally, uh, the downtown died. Uh, this was a very vibrant downtown. Um, you've heard these stories before, right? Uh, in a lot of the cities we go to, whether it be Heritage Ohio or even the National Trust, uh, the story is similar of how cities were, were thinking the future was going to be for urban centers. Uh, this is our city building uh, that kind of looks like a parking garage. I've actually had um, more than one people in, in my life here in Springfield stop and ask me if I know how to get into the parking garage, uh, thinking this is a parking garage, I guess parking garage with windows. Uh, this is one of those Skidmore Owens and Murrow buildings. Uh, this I think signifies the vision of the community, uh, getting rid of retail, getting rid of arts, getting rid of culture, making downtown purely for civic and, and business enterprises. Um, and they succeeded, and they succeeded in killing downtown Springfield. Again, thankfully, I'm not ending at that spot. So now the new champion city, uh, 2001 to today. Uh, I moved to Springfield in 1999 as a college student. Um, I thought this place was terrible. Uh, even when I graduated and started here at the Turner Foundation, I thought this place was terrible. I no longer do. I'm now uh, a cheerleader for this community. I, I, I love this place. Um, but it was not the place that I wanted to live. But the community started to put the pieces together to make the community that I wanted to live in and a lot of my colleagues wanted to live in um, by 2001. And the first major project was taking that building that I was showing you earlier, uh, the city building and market, the one with the really big tower, the one that um, I, I, I called a hot dog, uh, and turning that, I use this photo just because it's nice to have a color photo looking at the side of it to see some of the details, the stained glass windows. Uh, taking that building and turning it into our new history museum. This building was threatened by demolition twice, including the newspaper uh, fighting the person who was trying to save it, calling him basically an idiot for thinking it's beauty, beautiful, uh, calling it a ugly army barracks of a building. Um, it's, you can't believe people say these things, but this was the 1970s uh, and the 1980s. And um, if you look at the number one car that was selling in America in 19, around the same period, around 1981, it's understandable. Uh, we had a very skewed idea of what, what was beautiful in that period. 
Uh, this is inside the museum. I apologize. There's actually much more dynamic photos, but I looked through all of my photos today. I decided to add this right before we started and I didn't have a good photo. Um, this is a, I mean, there's, there's full um, fire engines and road rollers. Buffalo Springfield, for those of you that are fan, uh, fans of the band, uh, the, the company they got their name from is a road roller company. Um, that was based here in Springfield, Buffalo Springfield Road Roller, and they have full road rollers. Uh, they have multiple cars. They have a huge annex. Um, it is a very impressive building uh, to look at uh, heritage, to look at physical artifacts. Um, and, and when you're in town next year, you'll get a chance to walk through that. And again, that's from 2001. Starting at the same time in 2001 was the Westcott House. Uh, had fallen into severe disrepair uh, because this is not a talk that that's the point of. I didn't show you the decline photos, but you'll have a chance to see them next year when you're in town. This is a house that really, if it wasn't by Frank Lloyd Wright, should have just been demolished. It was in that bad of state. Uh, but thankfully, we had a community that understood its value. This is when I got involved in the house was 2001 um, as an intern, uh, not in any kind of uh, leadership capacity. Uh, my, I've had quite a journey with this property. But uh, this also started at the same time as the Turner Foundation. Uh, 2001 is when the Turner Foundation is created. And we were involved in the creation of the History Museum. We were involved heavily in the Westcott House, actually almost entirely. Uh, man, uh, um, contributing to the $6 million restoration of the Westcott House. So Turner is part of that renewal and rebirth. And then I was hired in 2003. Uh, I do not deserve credit for this stuff. I'm part of the larger group, uh, that movement uh, to create all of this also kind of created me, created my position. And then the Pennsylvania House, this was another Turner Foundation project that, that we paid for. And this one we actually managed in-house. Um, it had been restored right after World War II, uh, but then we turned, actually bef before World War II, right before World War II. Um, and then we turned around and restored it again, removing the paint, trying to take it back to what it looked like um, with the last edition in the 1850s. Because um, the original structure is just the structure on the left uh, from the 18 1836. And that is a museum today as well. And then we are also heavily involved in the restoration of the Hartman Rock Garden. Um, this is one of the two sites in Springfield, along with the Westcott House, that gets visitors from all over the world. Uh, although right now, I'll say people from all over Ohio. I've not, I've not welcomed a visitor from outside of Ohio out to the garden while I've been out there since March, uh, which shows kind of where we're at with cultural tourism. But we still have a, even more regional tourism out there. Uh, this is that site created in 1932 by Ben Hartman. Um, it's it's something special. I mean, it's it's hard to describe until you get a chance to go and see it for yourself. Um, <clears throat> we're really proud of Westcott and, and Hartman Rock Garden because they're the two things that separate Springfield. Uh, in some ways, right? We like we we need to think as a society of the things that unite us as as humans. Um, but as communities, we're obviously we're ultimately all competing as well. And we need to think about the things that separate us, that make us special. And we really do that here in Springfield. We try to focus on Springfield's unique character, the things that make us different from Bell Fountain, make us different from, from Sydney, make us different from Cleveland, Columbus, Youngstown. Uh, I could go on and on. If I knew what cities all of you were from, I would try to name those cities, uh, but I, I don't have a list. <clears throat> And again, we'll find a way to get you out to the Hartman Rock Garden. It's not in the urban core. It's out in a suburban neighborhood about 10 minutes from the hotel, um, six, seven minutes, I guess, from the hotel, um, but, but definitely worth a visit, uh, one, of the, one of the unique spots of Ohio. And then we really, as I was saying before, really focus on this heritage, the, this history of the community, this really special history of the community is part of our rebirth. Uh, we have the largest architectural tourism program outside of Chicago, um, uh, and it is, it's massive. We offer, uh, we have about 50 different interpreted tours of our community, ranging from African-American neighborhoods that are part of segregation um, and redlining to, to Irish neighborhoods uh, that were part of the Champion City uh, to uh, Millionaire's Row along East High Street. Uh, this is uh, Warder Library, which I was showing you earlier. Uh, me looking quite goofy in, in light blue pants. I'm not quite sure what I was thinking with those. Uh, but this is, I think, for the 100, yeah, this day was the 125th anniversary of the dedication of Warder Library. So we offered a tour there. Uh, we only uh, had 40 spots available and it sold out in minutes um, because 
one of the things about this community is it loves its heritage. Uh, and, and so we sell out almost every tour we offer because the community just loves what it has and, and really appreciates it. And then again, trying to use that heritage, exploit that heritage, if you will. Uh, Lillian Gish is from Springfield. We've had several uh, uh, national or dare I say international uh, film fe festivals dedicated to Lillian Gish. She lived in several towns in Ohio. She was born here and moved back to Springfield right before she made it big in Hollywood uh, with her first film. And really the combination of all of our various assets, we will go to Westcott and we'll project her films on the back of the, the museum on this great Frank Lloyd Wright structure. Uh, and then even have like live DJ spinning contemporary scores with her silent films, uh, really trying to be avant-garde and push the boundaries of, of art and, and uh, cultural tourism. And then one of my favorite projects, this is a project I just finished, was taking the children's book author Lois Linsky and using her poetry to create a tour of our urban environment, where it's her words about what it is to be in an urban uh, setting and in using those to educate children about that urban setting. Um, really, I mean, I'm, I'm really proud of this project, as you can tell with the, the glow in, in my, my face and, and my tone. Um, it's, it's just something I'm, I'm really proud of. And then part of that we also created uh, in partnership with, the, uh, with our art museum and with our public library, an exhibit featuring her original drawings from her children's books. So for those of you that grew up with Lois Linsky, she was at one point, uh, I would say one of the two or three most famous American children's book authors. The reality of uh, children's books from the 1930s and 40s is they don't translate too well to today, uh, but you can still buy her books. Actually, last time I was through Dayton um, Airport, uh, one of her books was out on display at the airport as one of their uh, recommended buys from their gift shop. And then uh, one of my favorite spaces uh, is Mother Stewart's Brewery. And I use this to talk again about heritage. This is, uh, even though I didn't talk about it in my talk, Springfield also becomes one of the funerary capitals of the world, uh, the capital of death. Uh, we are making embalming fluid in caskets. We are one of the largest casket manufacturers. Several American presidents are buried in, in Springfield caskets. Uh, Buffalo Bill is buried in a Springfield casket. Um, really important company. This is part of the Springfield Mental Casket Factory. So we took a Victorian casket factory and turned it into a brewery and then named the brewery after one of the most famous women in the world in the history of temperance and prohibition, Mother Stewart. Uh, she is rolling in her grave. Uh, she's buried about a half mile from this brewery. Uh, but turning in her grave that that happened, a lot of people in the community are quite upset about using her name and, and not likeness, but it, originally her likeness as well. Uh, they stopped doing that. Uh, but if you're looking for a great spot to uh, drink a beer, uh, I have not found a brewery that I think is better designed for community interaction than this place. I've been to a lot of them. Um, maybe I'm, maybe you all are thinking that I have a drinking problem with how much I'm emphasizing this. Uh, but uh, we have some great breweries across Ohio, but on the, the urban landscape, how this fits into it, uh, really, really important. And then here's the inside. I just love this photo. Um, they removed the floors on some of the casts on the floor levels to be able to put their tanks. Their tanks today stretch almost up to those, those ceilings. They're not quite, but a good part up to those ceilings. Uh, quite a dramatic space uh, in, in the environment. And then the last two things, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll finish up, is um, what we're working on today. We're working a lot in murals. Uh, this doesn't necessarily separate us. A lot of cities are working in murals. It's a, it's a great idea. Uh, we have this mural. It's about 100 feet long. This is only a small section of it. Using those catalogs, literally, that's why I scanned those catalogs that I was showing you earlier in this talk. We use those catalogs and sent them to an artist in Denver. She pieced them together into this amazing mural, uh, taking obviously artistic liberty so it all fits together and doesn't look like uh, disparate images pulled that together, had this uh, logo that's from one of the front of the catalogs about being the floral center of the world, excuse me, and, um, and painted this by hand across this entire structure right in the heart of the community. Uh, it's something you will see when you're here in Springfield. Uh, I think one of the, the best murals uh, that's been put up and in, in, that I've seen in the past five to 10 years, uh, a really a great project. And at the same time, uh, something that a lot of towns are doing, working with the Greetings Tour project and, and bringing those artists in. One of them originally from Ohio, from Canton, uh, they now do this all over North America, traveling around in their RV, uh, uh, painting these murals for communities. So this was a, a, a 
a great project really updating those old postcards and looking at the things that make us significant. And you'll see it's performing arts. We have a really rich performing arts. Food, again, uh, horticulture, uh, really important. Uh, whitewater rafting and those NGF. Uh, Springfield was the first city to open up uh, urban uh, kayaking and canoeing through the heart of the community in our river, Buck Creek. Again, not a beautiful name for a river. Um, but now a lot of cities are doing it, but uh, we have rapids right in the heart of the community on when you're on our kind of main street going north and south and look over the bridge, you'll see rapids and kayakers going through it. It's, it's quite beautiful and then rock climbing right around the corner from that. And then the last two are the Westcott House and the Hartman Rock Garden, those two cultural tourism sites, those two uh, amazing acts of preservation uh, that we feel really set our community apart, not just from other communities in Ohio, but other communities in the Midwest. So this is that, that encompassing thing of Springfield uh, that we're really proud of, of, of showcasing what we're proud about about our community. All right, uh, Joyce, are, do we have time for some questions? Yes, please, if uh, anybody wants to write in a question, ask Kevin about something about Springfield, about our future there, we'd want to answer that. You are all now experts on Springfield history. <laughs> I noticed you tactfully avoided the arcade. <laughs> yes, I, the, the hard thing about covering 200 years of history is uh, Springfield, as I've said, has a, has a very rich history. Um, it's why I'm here as a historian. Um, I'm, my town's history is not quite as rich uh, as, as Springfield's. And I'm amazed at the things, the stories you, you can't include, you can't talk about. Uh, just because there's not time. And, uh, I know tonight I'll be like, oh my goodness, I can't believe I didn't mention <laughs> this. Uh, we did have one of those famous losses. Uh, I won't, I don't think quite as bad as Tiffin's loss, um, but uh, a, a pretty terrible loss where we demolished our arcade from, from 1884, 1883, 1884. Well, if there are no questions, again, I, I really look forward to welcoming you all to Springfield. Uh, you were last in Springfield for those of you that, that were uh, in 2005 as part of the Heritage Ohio Conference. It was five, right Joyce? Yeah. And um, our city's changed a lot. You, you saw those things. 2005 was that moment that we really started taking off and that's why Heritage Ohio came to Springfield. But here we are 15 years later or 16 years later by next year and the, the community has matured um, I'm again showing you, or I was showing you the things that really, I think, separate us, but we also have a lot of those things that we're also really proud of. Uh, downtown, uh, storefront, uh, revitalization projects, bringing in independent coffee houses and new restaurants and locally grown restaurants, I should add. Uh, a marketplace that has been opened back up and is now our, our urban eatery um, with, uh, with a bunch of different eateries around the core right across from the hotel. Um, so much of that, that character in life, not even coming back, but different than it was. Uh, we're never going to recreate the success of Springfield of the 1920s, 1930s as the community. We're going to hopefully build something better. And I, that's the goal of what we're trying to do, something different, something new, uh, and looking to a lot of you for inspiration. Uh, so we're, we're really excited to showcase it next year. And um, yeah, so we'll welcome you then. Oh, oh, how is your tax credit project coming along? Is that going to be closer to completion next year? Well, we have several tax credit projects in the works right now, but yes. Um, so I can't give away too many details, but we just had a, a design meeting yesterday with a firm that is looking at taking on, um, they like to paint with a wide brush stroke, I'll say. So they, they really want to come in and take on a lot at once in Springfield. Uh, they have the capacity and the experience. So, um, Certainly by next year, we will not just have announced that, that major partnership, um, but hopefully be finished with some of the projects because some of them are, are, are a timeline where we're looking uh, some smaller buildings and we're gonna start on those almost immediately as soon as we can announce the, the partnership. And then uh, buildings like REN, which is that tax credit project that Joyce is mentioning, uh, which is a, a five story, a former department store um, in downtown Springfield that is being converted into market rate housing. Uh, kind of a classic story of the American Midwest, right? Former department stores turned into housing or hotels, um, in this case, housing. Uh, that will be in, in the works and hopefully at a spot that we'll be able to get everyone through and, and see, the, see the space. 
That's very exciting. Great. Well, Kevin, thank you very much. And uh, thank you for wrapping up our conference with a fun Zoom through Springfield. Everybody, thank you so much. All conference goers have access to the recorded sessions, the pre-recorded sessions, the vendor halls. Go to the Eventbrite site and you will be able to add access that for months. Uh, to the best of our knowledge. We don't know when Eventbrite uh, kills us off, but uh, you're, you're going to have access for a long time and we want you to enjoy anything that you weren't able to see. And thank you very Joyce, much. Joyce, can I say congratulations yes. to you and staff. Uh, I've attended a lot of digital content, digital programming. I think uh, Heritage Ohio has, has really impressed a lot of people across the state and, and even beyond at your ability of holding a two-week conference with with great programming so I, I applaud you and your full staff for your, your hard work and, and really pulling off an extra excellent conference thank you everyone worked really hard at it and of course we had the zoom shut down the first day it was very exciting so <laughs> adds to the stories that you'll you'll, you'll tell people <laughs> you remember right thank you very much kevin we'll see you soon bye bye